I like to think of hoof trimming as an intervention that has two goals, right? The goal is to either prevent lameness or to treat lameness. So we kind of talked about treating lameness um, with that. So the prevention, when we design a trimming program, I think we want to make sure that when we bring a cow to the hoof trimming chute, because there's a economic cost associated with it, but also probably like a stress cost to the cow, that the benefits we get of doing that um, outweigh um, the costs with it. So when I think of trimming programs, I want to make sure that we base it on data, but also that we're doing something that's good from a preventative perspective, like good for the animal health, but also from an economic and welfare perspective. Welcome to another episode of Dairy Health Black Belt by Wisenetics. I'm Luciano Cacheta, I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota, and I have the pleasure to have here today one of my colleagues here at the University of Minnesota and one of the leading experts on lameness uh, in, on the planet, Dr. Gerard Kramer. Uh, thank you for being here today, uh, Gerard. You're welcome. It's fun to be back. Yes. So a, a few, we had a conversation before about like, uh, the lameness situation and what it is. And we talk about chronic cows and, uh, and uh, new cases. And like, it was good to hear that we're making progress. We have fewer new cases that we would have. There's different strategies for those different groups of cows. So it's good. We, we makes us feel good that we're going the right direction. It's still a lot long process, but we're going that way. But one thing that I would like to talk to you today is uh, there, there is a lot of, uh, debate and there's a lot of opinions about uh, trimming cows on a regular basis. Like we talked last time about therapeutic trimming, but there's a lot of uh, work that's done on preventive treat uh, or routine trimming at the farm. Um, can you explain a little bit for the the, the ones the uh, listeners that are not very uh, familiar with the topic, what what those things are, and like so we can set a, a baseline for our discussion. I like to think of hoof trimming as an intervention that has two goals, right? The goal is to either prevent lameness or to treat lameness. So we kind of talked about treating lameness um, with that. So the prevention, when we design a trimming program, I think we want to make sure that when we bring a cow to the hoof trimming chute, because there's a economic cost associated with it, but also probably like a stress cost to the cow, that the benefits we get of doing that um, outweigh um, the costs with it. So when I think of trimming programs, I want to make sure that we base it on data, but also that we're doing something that's good from a preventative perspective, like good for the animal health, but also from an economic and welfare perspective. And and when you see that you say that they outweigh that, is that like on the uh, not having the lame is that therefore be able to produce more milk and being able to eat more? The easiest way I'd like to, like to think about it is, let's say I trim 100 cows as a preventative trim, right? So these cows have no, no history of lesions and I trim 100 cows. How many lameness cases do I have to prevent to make that 100 cow trimming pay, right? So let's say a trimming costs, I'm going to throw a number out, let's say $20 a cow because the math is easy. That means I'm 20, spending $2,000 to trim those 100 cows. Um, let's assume there's no milk loss with bringing the cow to the shoot, right? So that means I have to present, prevent X number of cases to recoup that $2,000 investment. So let's say a case of lameness on average cost, people throw around a $300. So let's throw around that number, right? So they need to prevent six to seven cases of lameness by my preventative trimming to pay from it from an economical perspective, right? If that's the sole criteria we're using to judge. Wisenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. That's, uh, that's good. So, uh, in our experience, and I know personally know that you're doing uh, some experiments and some studies with this. So uh, what do you see out there? Like it, not long ago, we, there was a, uh, we saw a project and a paper in Europe showing like, yeah, multiple times, even within a lactation was whatever they, uh, they prescribed. So right. what, what do we have here? <laughs> so 
I'm not going to argue that trimming cows more frequently reduces your lameness prevalence because what happens is the chronic cows that we've talked about previously get seen more frequently so they feel better and we manage those. Um, but then if we start looking at just the new cases and if we're preventing cases, then the data gets a lot cloudier um, and the studies we've done so far, we might get them on first lactation animals, I'd be pretty confident saying maybe we get a 1% decrease in lameness by trimming. So if I trim 100 cows, I prevent one lameness case. Um, in second lactation and third lactation, we're currently doing a study and the number might be a little bit higher, but it's not up to the six or seven that we just discussed type thing, right? So the impact of trimming exists. I'm not discounting that. Um, it's just, is it big enough if we're just looking at sole economic return to in work, make it worth the investment and the hassle that we're doing? And this is interesting. It, it's hard because like we talk about the strategies for uh, working with these chronic cows or the new cases you know, that in the different episodes. So everybody like you should try to get that episode and listen to it. But like what I'm interpreting and like what I'm hearing from you, like, we need like those cows that need intervention and they need to be seen. It's good for them, but other cows are not, and we might not might not be paying off that investment. So that could potentially open up some uh, uh, labor efficiency that could potentially focus more on those cows that actually need help instead of like just trimming the in a way the easy one. We all know like the, that. Yes. Maintenance one is like a quick one, right? <laughs> right. And that's that's where um, I think we need to focus on, right? We I like to think, like we talk about how many um, freestyle slots are on a dairy. I like to think in way in terms of how many trim slots. So there's this X many trim slots on a dairy. I want to make sure I put the right cows in it. If I can free up, take out a preventative trim because we're not going to benefit that particular cow and slot in a cow that I've detected lame earlier we're going to have a bigger return for that trim slot. And I'm not taking a trim slot with a preventative trim that really should have a lame cow trim in it. Cause I've seen a lot of dairies where we focus so much on the trim list, which is basically driven by preventative trims. And we then, then don't have time to look for lame cow. So some dairies, what we've said is, okay, we're going to reduce the trim list. And then the employees are going to go find the newly lame cows. Right. So then we become a bit more strategic saying, okay, we have this newly lame cow. She's going to benefit from my trimming more so than the routine, easy maintenance trim. Right. So then the employee says, okay, we have a trim list for chronic cows and for healthy cows that dry off. I think still think that's necessary, but then the other cows, they go look for them. Right. So there she's lame, she's long. So it actually puts more onus on the employee um, so that takes a different level of management for when we can pull that off. I think then we have both better, something that's better for the animal and better for the farm from an economic perspective. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And like that it's all about allocation of labor now, right? Like super hard. And you made, you made a comment like the labor, the, the farm employee now has time to go find the lame cow. So what's your strategy? How, how do we find those? <laughs> Um, so that's the hardest part of all of this. So this only works like when I talk about strategic treatment, that only works in farms that are going to dedicate the resources to finding lame cows. And to do that, um, we can either use technology, which isn't a hundred percent at this stage, or we can use labor, right? But that means you're paying somebody to stand there and look for cows, either in the parlor as they're coming off the rotary or walking through and doing checks as they're in the parlor or you're watching them walk out of a return lane and they're standing there um, on a routine basis. So some of the larger farms I work with, what we do is we take a pen. So we look at the fresh pot pen basically every day. So every day the fresh pen gets looked at for a lame cow. And then every other pen gets looked at basically on a weekly basis. So if there's eight cows or seven pens, eight pens on a dairy, we just cycle through. So pen one is Monday, pen two is Tuesday. Then we identify and sort off the lame cows in that scenario. So that just creates a routine. It makes it a structured routine and somebody's dedicated to doing it. And then we have success because we're reducing the duration of disease basically. Well, and I think like it's super interesting to hear that because it, it definitely improved the, 
the chance of the person to find because they're looking for for that for like 40 minutes, not for like an eight hour shift. Exactly. Which I assume would like decrease that like accuracy, right? Yes. I have some students scoring CALS for eight hours right now and I know what that's like. And <laughs> yeah. We do it for research, but I don't want farm staff to do that to find lame cows. I know. That's probably a good way to lose some employees. <laughs> um, yeah. And so just like this is like coming out of the left field here and like it's just something that came to me is like, what about like people abroad uh, abroad that have some uh, pasture raised animals? Like, is there any different strategy for them? I so I would say yes. Um, there's some work out of New Zealand that shows maybe a benefit once in a while, the trimming. But I think about it like our beef cows, like we have a colleague that we work with that says if a beef cow needs to be trimmed, she needs to go on a truck because um, that's not feasible. And I would argue it's probably very similar to, for the pasture situation. Yes, we need to trim the lame cow. But if there's where and in most scenarios that I'm aware of, like in the pasture situations and different places in the world, the problem is typically thin soles because they're walking so much to get places. So then trimming isn't necessarily indicated because trimming is really trying to correct an imbalance between wear and growth. And in the pasture situation, on most cases, that balance is basically right on. Um, whereas in concrete doesn't wear the same. So that's why we have this imbalance that we need to trim at least probably once a year on most cow house cows. No, that's, that's very good. Again, thank you again for, for your time and for sharing your wisdom on cow foot health with us. It's always nice to hear uh, from the experts. You're welcome. It was a pleasure being there. So this is the end of uh, another episode of Dairy Health Black Belt, uh, uh, powered by Wisenetics. Uh, if you like this conversation, uh, subscribe to the channel, send us message, send us actually feedback and some suggestions. We would like to, to entertain your uh, op, uh, your feedback to get like the topics that you you want to hear and like subscribe to the channel so you knew what you know when new uh, podcast episodes are available uh, with that I'm closing out for today I'm Luciano Cacheta and this is the Dairy Health Black Belt podcast thank you <laughs>